Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Talking Biotech podcast by Calabra. Now, those of you who followed the podcast for the last nine plus years know that there are two places where I don't usually go very well, and that's brains and immune systems. And so I always like to have guests on who can help me understand these better and better define some of the cool new therapies or diagnostic kits or or other new remedies that are sitting at the edge of new developments. And so I was very excited to be able to talk to our guest today. So our guest today is Dr. Nigel McCracken. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Virex Biolab. So welcome to the podcast, uh, Dr. McCracken. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's nice to be here and it's nice to speak with your, uh, with your peers. Yeah, thank you. It's really nice to have you aboard because I, I, was, I was poking around on the website a little bit to learn more about this this technology, especially as it applies to issues like long COVID, which we've spoken about a lot on the podcast, especially about its effects uh, that may be exciting uh, other complications. So detection is super important. And so let's um let, let's start at kind of at the beginning. Could you give us a little bit of background or mostly give me a little bit of background in what the immune system is? So I know we have the humoral immunity and then is that the funny one? Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, humoral the immunity one, yeah, exactly. <laughs> versus yeah. uh, innate uh, uh, immune systems. That, and what are their components? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think when we're ever exposed to, uh, say, a pathogen, something external and stuff like that. Generally what happens is the innate immune system is, is a very gen, general part of your info, uh, your your immune system and, and it usually sort of targets. So when we talk about the innate system, we're talking about things like uh, neutrophils and macrophages and white, white cells and stuff and things like that. But what they do is they, they just, they have a, a general response to the actual pathogen to remove that sort of thing. And again, they release uh, uh, cytokines and chemokines, and we'll talk about these later on, but really just to, to try and get rid of that in a general sort of way. And, and, and in doing so, and we'll talk about a little bit about inflammation, it, you, you actually do, inflammation is not a bad thing to, to get rid of viruses. So that's exactly what it specifically do. It triggers the, the body's innate immune system to get rid of the virus. And then when we talk about the adaptive immune system, if your body can't clear it, then it most probably needs more of a precise uh, you know, a targeted of that. And then what happens then, the adaptive immune system provides this more targeted effect where it creates um, you know, antibodies, the B cells create antibodies, and then the T cells, the, 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 the cytotoxic uh, killer cells actually go and kill the virus. Okay, that helps a lot because one of the things I saw on your website was a uh, reference of something called T cell exhaustion. And so yeah. what, what, what is T cell exhaustion and, and how does that play a role in, in uh, illness or in response to a pathogen? I mean, it's interesting because I, I've known about T cell exhaustion uh, from an onco oncological point of view. So most of the uh, immuno-oncology drugs ah. um, <laughs> treat something like PD-1 or LAV3 or TIGIT. And these are exhaustion markers and whatever you know. And, and the re what happens, certainly in oncology, what happens with T cell exhaustion, you get, a, they call it a cold tumor, an immunosuppressed tumor, whatever you know. So there's not antigen presenting cells. So there's nothing for the T cells to kill the actual cancer. Now, from a virus point of view, it's in a similar sort of thing in that if you get chronic antigen stimulation, then basically what happens is you're, you're, you're your T cells start to not function uh, as proper uh, as as well as the, the as they actually should do. So they don't release the appropriate uh, chemokines or cytokines to specifically fight the infection, uh, and that's what we're talking about. That, that T cell dysfunction or that T cell exhaustion, and where the where your adaptive immune system is not efficiently working properly because it can remove the virus without potentially hurting some of your own organs. And if you, you, you talked about SARS-CoV, if you remember with the SARS-CoV with, you know, people who were very, very ill, they had these cytokine storms, and that's basically where the immune system was just overactive and then it was affecting organs. And that's what uh, in, in they're trying to avoid to do that. And you get that T cell exhaustion. And in doing so, that dysfunction causes other problems. 
Is there a component of this that has to do with aging as, you know, T-cells were called T-cells because they originated from the thymus, which kind of disappears as we age. So does that also play a role in the exhaustion process? Um, to a, to a certain extent, I mean, when you you can you you're talking about something T cell depletion, so so you're right. If you've got less ah, T cells, okay. uh, or if your T cells that you have aren't functioning properly, they're just less effective at actually you know removing the virus. You know, and and the thing about you talked about well COVID, and we'll maybe go on to that a little bit. It's not necessarily just the SARS cov. If the T cells aren't functioning properly, some of your latent viruses are viruses that we're all exposed yeah. to, like herpes or, or CMV or EBV. They become they come back up to the front. So it's not just SARS CoV that's causing the problem. It's a it it can be a, a melee of different viruses which are which are which actually are come back up from from some sort of dormant tissue that they've been uh, lagging in for the last number of years. Yeah, that's really interesting. I had a CMV infection come back last November, put me in the hospital, and yep. they had a team of infectious uh, of infectious disease specialists who couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, and so they still don't know. I mean, it was or whether it was cause or effect. So I may be looking for one of your products again someday if it happens <laughs> again. What is the major mission that your company set out to solve? Well, what we're wanting to do is we we're basically wanting to have a portfolio of, of T cell diagnostics and immune profiling solutions, and that we want to be able to look at the adaptive immune system. We want to to be able to assess a person's adaptive immune status, but also we want to evaluate the protective immunity. The thing, the, the interesting thing around around the adaptive immune system is you have these memory T cells. I, they, they remember the infection, and usually when you're then exposed to that infection again, you know they they go straight for and they attack it sort of thing or whatever. So, in relation to there's there's almost two parts to it sort of thing. When we think about the adaptive immune status, and we'll be talking about this T cell exhaustion or T cell dysfunction. When we think about something like long COVID, which is a post-viral syndrome sort of thing, whatever you know, a post-viral infection, and we also know people maybe who have got ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, or even people have been exposed to something like Lyme disease for a long period of time, they have symptoms that are very similar, like chronic, you know, chronic fatigue. They also have some cognitive sort of things, which are actually very related to either dysfunction of the adaptive immune system in particular T cells, but also chronic inflammation. And we'll go into this a little bit sort of later on. Inflammation is a good thing when you're trying to fight an infection because you need to create that environment which is hostile, either to the a bacterial infection or a viral infection. But you certainly don't want that thing to be chronic. And we know about chronic infl- inflammation is not a good thing. And we also know about things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is this autoimmunity where the body is, is actually attacking itself. So it's trying to actually have tests that give guidance uh, you know, to individuals, uh, either around their own protective immunity to specific viruses if they get exposed again, or specifically looking at their adaptive immune system and seeing, you know, if it's in a specific way or if it's dysfunctional. And if it is dysfunctional, can you um, can you detect it early enough to have some sort of intervention? But that intervention or that management, it may well be a lifestyle, might be a diet, but there may also be some therapeutic that's getting uh, getting actually, you know, uh, developed, uh, you know, specifically for that. Okay, so this makes a lot more sense to me. So this is essentially a a product line that really does a diagnostic assessment of the status of T-cells, whether they're too high or too low, and uh, whether that uh, could be underlying either uh, the presence of a potential problem or maybe your ability to combat disease going forward. Is that kind of in the ballpark? Yes. So if you think about the evaluation of your protective immunity, and and Ultimately, everybody's been exposed to SARS-CoV, and and we will get exposed to SARS-CoV in the future. It, it doesn't seem to be as as much of a problem as it was, but but there are certain people in the population, uh, you know, who are immune compromised. 
So you talked about CMD and SARS-CoV or anything like that. If, if, if you're immune compromised and your immune system is not working properly, something like a reinfection of a SARS-CoV or a CMV or a latent, it can cause problems. And whatever you know, and and if you know your immune status to certain viruses, then you will know if you've got a memory T cell response specifically to that, and that will be helpful to give you sort of guidance around: Are you at greater risk? Now, specifically in relation to measuring something like T cell dysfunction, is there the possibility when you think about a post viral syndrome? And we know it's a huge burden to society. We 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 know that there's of almost 60 million, maybe 60 million plus people who have got symptoms associated with long, co uh, long COVID uh, and there are other post viral syndromes that have similar, similar sort of uh, symptoms specifically. But that chronic inflammation uh, and is is a real burden to society in that people can't work. Some of them can't get up out of bed and whatever, you know. And the question is, is can you detect that dysfunction early? and then have an intervention prior to getting it to a stage where it's a lot harder to come back from. No, that's really helpful. We, we have been talking a lot about inflammation, and I know that when I read things online, I sometimes see inflammation or claims about inflammation that it, that do kind of seem a little dubious. And so we you know we're, we're, uh, that you know you're having all these problems because of inflammation, and it's used by like folks in alternative yeah. medicine all the time. Sure. So can you give me a really clear idea of what is inflammation mean? Like what, what what's actually happening physiologically that underlies um, inflammation from a molecular physiological perspective? I mean, when we talk about inflammation in, in general, I mean, we're, we're all exposed to it. I played a, I played a lot of sports. So usually when you, when you get a bang there, you, 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 you're, you're going to get some inflammation. You'll, you'll get swelling, whatever you, because your body's repeating. Or again, if you butt yourself, it's the same sort of thing. If you get a cold, it's the same. These, inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing. But when we talk about inflammation, in particular, when we're talking about you know, what we're trying to measure, it's, it's more around oxidative stress. Uh, now, oxidative stress, again, usually we know about it in oncology. We also know about it from a viral point of view in that when, you are, when you're exposed to something, your body, you want to create an environment which is toxic and, and, and which, is, which is not you know, great for the virus or even for, say, a, you know, a cancer specifically. So it, you get oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress is just a, is a ratio of reactive oxygen species that people know about because they're the things that age us, and whatever you know, and antioxidants, and whatever you know, and it's just a ratio of that. So when I'm talking about... Um, chronic inflammation or inflammation in relation to post-viral syndromes, I'm, I'm talking more about that oxidative stress in that when, you, when you've got that environment which is, which is hostile and it is more chronic, it's going to cause problems uh, specifically to you. And it can damage organs, it can, it, it, you know, it can, and again, it can deplete your T cells and it can also have an, have an effect on your mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. And generally the mitochondria in the body is, is, is basically 95% of the energy source. So you can start to think about linking certain things to symptoms like chronic fatigue. And again, as well as that, you know, that chronic inflammation, and I know that you know, long COVID has been linked to things like cognitive as well. You can think inflammation in the brain, you've got leaky uh, blood vessels have been associated with that. It's generally not a good thing to, to have chronic inflammation, or at least to be able to understand, you know, why you have that. So you do hear about a lot about, you can change your diet, you can do your lifestyle, and you can generally try and, you know, affect it without having any specific, uh, you know, therapeutic intervention. It by itself, you know, we, we hear about anti-inflammatories like non-steroidal anti inflammatory you know, I, of course we can take these sort of things and whatever, you know, but again, it, it's just this general chronic inflammation. And we'll go back to that burden thing. What I can see, certainly in the US and, and certainly where we are in, in, based in the UK, the, the, the incidences of of people who have chronic inflammation is getting higher and higher. And that will cause a burden on society because we know what these things can cause sort of thing. And, and, and with, with 
although we hear about long COVID now, there's been lots of things like chronic fatigue and ME, which have been about for many, many years. And, you know, and, and the symptoms are very, very similar. Yeah, there's a, there, when you mention inflammation, especially with respect to uh, the molecular markers that are associated with it, um, I see your product line has a sensitivity or a way to detect um, TN, uh, TNF-alpha, yeah. which has been associated in some ways with inflammation, especially with related to brain uh, neurological disorders, including Alzheimer's, things like that, at least in association, uh, maybe causal, maybe not. I don't know what the status of that is, but what is the... Um, what what is the uh, product line for TNF alpha? The product you have for TNF alpha, and why is that significant? Yeah, no, I mean TNF alpha is one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, and and you you have other ones like interferon gamma, uh, interleukin two. So there's lots of different uh, cytokines that you can you can measure. So when we when we if you look at a product line, there's there's different combinations that you can you can look at, and um, so something like we we talked about the you know when you're looking at your protective immunity or your memory T cell, most what people you usually look at interferon gamma because it's an it's a it's a good marker to give you some guidance around that you know that memory T cell response that you you've you've got an immune response you know um, uh, to a specific bias. So again, TNF alpha by itself is just a cytokine, it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine that you usually measure now. Go back to something like long COVID and, and T cell exhaustion in particular. If you look at a lot of papers and stuff, they say that, you know, T cell exhaustion, you know, tend to, you see, re reduced interferon gamma TNF alpha IL2 sort of thing. So as we develop, as we develop a test specifically for something like long COVID or a post viral syndrome, um, although we are, yes, we, TNF alpha is one of the cytokines that we would look at, but when we think about that phenotypic signature that is associated with symptoms of, say, chronic fatigue or or cognitive brain cognitive uh, symptoms associated with low, it it will be a combination of of different cytokines that we will look at. And whenever you know, so it might not just be TNF alpha; it might be a combination of TNF alpha and 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 something else, sort of things. And, and is there a diagnostic quality to that? Like if you could see specific ratios of different cytokines, yeah. does that help provide guidance into the type of uh, yeah. disorder so, so that you, you may be chasing? Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, it, when you're when you're actually developing a diagnostic and whatever you know obviously there needs to be some sort of utility at the end of it because again it has to have some sort of value or some predictive value or some sort of help for the individual or you know or for the gp who is actually trying to to help them so our thought with respect to something like long COVID, you will you will put together a, a a ratio of different cytokines with maybe different cutoffs which will be linked to some sort of approved questionnaire associated with say chronic fatigue or something cognitive like brain fog or something like that where there's a approved scoring system and you will link that signature to that so you've got some sort of prediction of if I measure if I measure these specific cytokines with a specific ratio it will predict symptoms associated with chronic fatigue and and brain fog which are more related to the dysfunction now if you know anything about long COVID, there's lots of symptoms associated with it. There, I think there's over 200. We're not trying to go for 200 symptoms. What we're trying to, to, to develop are T-cell diagnostics and look at the T-cell dysfunction and the, and the actual symptoms that are associated with that T-cell dysfunction. Oh, very good. Well, we're speaking with Dr. Nigel McCracken. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Virax Biolabs. This is the Talking Biotech Podcast by Calabra, and we'll be back in just a moment. And then we tower back on the Talking Biotech Podcast. We're speaking with Dr. Nigel McCracken. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Virax Biolabs. And we're talking about the ways that new technologies can be used to assess the status of various types of T cells and other cytokines that can uh, be potentially diagnostic of, of disorders, inflammation, but may also have some other predictive value. Um, so let's talk about T cells. I know that in the lab, uh, in yeah, the, the podcast. podcast here, we've spoken a lot about CAR T cell therapy over the years, but um, 
we already talked a little bit about uh, T cells and how they're related to immune response, but let's go a layer deeper. Like what do, what do they actually do inside the body? I mean, T cell. what I was saying to you before, I mean, the T cells themselves, and, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're there to kill specific viruses in a very specific way. And when we talk about T cells, you know, they, as I say, they, they play a role in killing infected cells uh, or helping other immune cells to perform their functions more effectively. And when we talk about T cells, you know, we have helper T cells and we also have cytotoxic T cells or CD positive T cells. And we have regulatory T cells and memory T cells. But again, what the, what the T cells do is they, they pretty much get rid of the virus in a very specific manner. And then we also mentioned, you know, once they've specifically done that, they have this memory uh, specifically that they remember the virus. So if you get exposed to it again, it's a very quick response. And and we talked about regulatory T cells and and also and we also we're also aware certainly in the long COVID we talked about this whole cytokine storm thing with the regulatory T cells the, the, there's that regulatory part that actually keeps it in check that it doesn't go too far sort of thing so it releases cytokines that are actually you know that that reduce the inflammatory like something like IL ten and stuff and things like that so there are specific different types of T cells we talked about the helper cells and again the helper Cells are there to, you know, to you know, to bring the right chemokines and cytokines specifically to the party to kill the virus. So, so yes, it's it's fairly complicated. But it, it, I go back to what I was saying to you before: if the innate immune system can't deal with the problem, I the pathogen, then it, the adaptive immune system because it comes in. We have the B cells and the T cells. The B cells will create the you will create the antibodies and the antigens, and then the T cells will specifically kill the kill the virus in in, in particular. Well, it seems to me. So we talk a lot about CAR T cell therapy on the podcast. We've had a number of uh, guests on regarding this technology, and what we've seen over the last maybe five, six, seven years of talking about it is that it isn't as cut and dry as we thought. That there are many caveats that have to be considered within a patient's uh, response or potential uh, lack of response to this kind of therapeutic, it's some which can be dangerous. So how can your technologies really guide physicians potentially in administering a CAR T cell therapy? Well, that's a great point, uh, Kevin. As you know, CAR T cell therapies, and certainly in oncology and hematological oncology, has been about for a number of years. And specifically, it was it is quite expensive because it was specifically related to the person's T cells where you would take T cells out that you'd manufacture and then put them back in. I think nowadays they're you know to try and keep those costs down, people are moving to more that allergenic type of off the shelf, you know, where you have T cells that people can use. So when to your point, the question is is if you have some T cell diagnostic, could you help either identify patients who would benefit most because T cell uh, CAR T cell therapy doesn't benefit everyone. So the question is is could you determine that? And what if you know if you're looking at some of these T cells or their immune system or whatever in the general, could you actually help with that? And then when you think about dosing, the dosing of those that CAR T cell therapy, as you mentioned before, you've got to get this the number of T cells right or whatever you know, because if you go too far you cause you could potential problems and, and, and we've heard about certainly some cytokine storm storms specifically related to you know certainly strong patients or if you go too low you're not going to get the full effect so the thought here is is you know could we actually partner and help specifically with that and wonder if you know and then and that's certainly that's something that we would we would like to to think about and, and it's it's it is something that, that obviously, you know, pharma companies specifically are doing because it doesn't help everyone and it is very costly. However, it is very effective in, in certain people and, and it's it's been quite revolutionary. Um, and and our thought is is that certainly with uh, if you if you can look at the T cells and, and look at their functionality and, and their um, could you actually help with to be more precise and more helpful, specifically around that CAR T cell therapy. And then just going back to more 
regular familiar uh, disorders that we recognize, your, your product line seems to target quite a few of them. And, and it's a it's a really diverse product line. Some of them things I don't even recognize, but something like, let's say herpes, is this something that you would use to be able to detect if somebody perhaps had a latent infection yeah. and wasn't presenting where you would be able to detect it with either, uh, you know, physical markers of, of a herpes infection or PCR or something like that? Is, is it really to detect that the body has seen the virus? So so we mentioned that most of us have, have got all of these latent viruses. So we, herpes is one of the things that, you know, 80% of the population have got, have had herpes. And obviously some people manifest it a little bit more than others with cold sores and stuff and things like that. And we've also talked about things like CMV or EBV and whatever, you, when, when we talk about um, those specific viruses, it, the virus that we have platform and the platform that we specifically have, there are different components to the actual diagnostic uh, test. So we're, we're specifically using peptide mixes for each of the viruses to, to stimulate the T cells. And then we, we can actually see the response from that. So when we think about some like herpes or some of those other viruses, and we go back to, you know, the, the whole thing around the post viral syndrome uh, or, or long COVID in particular, the chances are it's not just SARS-CoV by itself that's causing the problem. It's that SARS-CoV, the antigen stimulation, the T cells aren't working. You've got you've got something like herpes, maybe EBV that are, are starting to come up and overwhelming the the actual system. So when we when you look at our product line, our product line is there to sort of help researchers who are working within that. But when we think about something like a post-viral syndrome, we know. Uh, that you need to not, uh, something like long COVID, you can't just look uh, about the effect of SARS-CoV. Uh, you've got to look at the other viruses as well, because the, the, the reality is it's most probably a combination. And that's the reason why our product line has got lots of different viruses that we can specifically look at, because the reality is it's most probably a combination of all of those that's causing the, the general uh, problem with a lot of these um, uh, symptoms that are associated with these post-viral syndromes like long COVID. And maybe we could touch on on really the technology more specifically, you know, if, if we can discuss like how exactly does this work that you mentioned that you're using peptides to stimulate the T cell response. And then so can you give me a little bit more of a sense on how that works? Yeah, it is, it's a 96 well play format. It, we're not using blood and plasma because with blood and plasma, you get lots of cytokines that are in it all the time. So the uh, historically, I think a lot of people have used things like ELISA. And ELISA is great. You can measure lots of different things. But again, depending how you're feeling, if you've got a cold, your cytokines are going to be up there. The nice thing is we're using PBMCs or you know, put your... Put your uh, you know, peripheral blood and mononucleosides. Now, when you work with PBMCs, you start with zero and then you're activating them. So we're activating them with a SARS-CoV peptide mix, which means the signature that we get from those T cells that are activated is very specific for SARS-CoV or is very specific for herpes. So we would, we rather than this, this general sort of cytokine signature that could be affected by a number of things, you know that it's specifically affected for that virus. Now, within that 96 well plate format, we, we have the ability, because we're using a, a technology called Fluorspot, um, within each well, we can have up to three cytokines that we specifically look at. And then usually with the 96 well uh, uh, plate format sort of thing, you've got eight wells and there's, and there's, there's, 12, there's 12 actually rows sort of thing. So you've got the ability to look at different combinations of cytokines that are specific to that virus wow. whatever you know so so there are there are a lot more uh, um, specific the signature is more specific and that's and now how we would do is we would actually capture that with a fluorescence reader sort of thing and that and again it's a general fluorescence reader it's not um specific you know like something like flow cytometry where, where it's very specific to the actual equipment that you specifically use. The good thing about the fluorospod and also flow cytometry is it gives you an idea about the origin of that signal or that T cell activation. Is it CD, CD4? Is it CD8? You know, so, and that's super important to understand because we, 
when we talk about the immune system, whatever you know, it is complex. And something like long COVID is a very complex um, sort of disease. And we know that as the you know as the months and years go on, and and we get more and more information out of that, we will we'll start to understand that now. Go back to where we, and if you look at the product list, you know, with the, the with the virus, I mean, we have the flexibility to move quite quickly, and um, you know, and with respect to the, the the technology and the different cytokines as well, sort of thing. So, going back to what we want to do is we want to have this portfolio um, of T cell diagnostics and immune profiling solutions that researchers can use, but specifically what we do want to do is to create some uh, in vitro diagnostics to CE market that clinicians can use to help either diagnose the T cell dysfunction early to help with the management of somebody who, who has got some like post viral syndrome. Uh, or to give some sort of guidance on a person, you know, uh, their immune profiling, uh, you know, the, the, the basic care and you know, whether they've got immune response to specific viruses. So again, for most people, it might not be that important, but certainly for some people who are more uh, at risk, either immune compromised, you know, or diabetic and whatever, it's, it's super important. Yeah, I think I'm really starting to understand this now. So you're, you're able to use a peptide, like a specific ligand for a yeah. specific T cell receptor. And then that will give you a fluorometric signal that's quantitative. It gives you a really good sense as to how much or how robust that particular response is in any given patient at any given time. It is. And, Am I right? It is, Do I get it? Yes, yes, you're, you're exactly right. Now, when you, when you okay. think about, just to give you, I mean, it's not the fact that the, uh, um, the, the technology hasn't been used before. It has been used before. So when you, when you think about something like, you know, um, you know, evaluation of predictive immunity, um, people who are immunocompromised, people who maybe receive, who are getting a transplant, you, you know that they're, that basically you, you, you're immune compromised, um, and, and usually you you'll get it's super important to to look at some viruses because again usually they're vaccinated prior to you know to transplant and and you also need to look at the recipient and the donor to see if they've got any specific you know uh, uh, and viral infections. And you mentioned sort of CMV before. CMV is one of these important things, certainly in, in transplant kidney transplants because yeah. you know in kidney transplants you. Know, because you're immune compromised, these latent viruses start to, to come up and cause problems. And whatever you know, and, and certainly with CMV, it can affect a number of organs. And it can be problematic, certainly for rejection, you know, a uh, you know, year down the line from, you know, following transplant. So there is the, uh, the ability to look at something like this for something like transplant, and it has been used before sort of thing. So, and it is used before, and that's certainly something that we will, will look to pursue as well. There's been a lot of interest in avian influenza lately yes. here in the states, anyway. And so, yeah. how do your product line? Uh, how is your product line used in examining avian influenza response? So, uh, to the point, and and as you mentioned, you know, we we have certainly within the within the, the within the facility in the lab, we have specific you know peptide chemistry, we have specific peptide mixes for the different viruses, and including uh, the avian flu. So again. You can you can look at the avian flu from the point of view of testing for it, and certainly you know we we have a antigen and PCR tests to 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 test specifically for that if need be. But it's more around the immune response as well. So again, you know, do you actually have an immune response specifically to that? Because if you do have a memory T cell immune response to that, then it would be potentially less problematic, sort of thing. Whatever you know, because it's not something completely new sort of thing. So, so again, at the moment we, we have the avian flu as research, uh, you know, uh, and sort of LDT as we, we would call it in the US sort of thing, whatever. And certainly they're there for, for, for researchers, uh, you know, to specifically use and, and, and work with. Yeah. And so for something like long COVID is, I, I'm imagining that this could be very useful because it wouldn't necessarily be uh, thrown off by new variants, right? You would be able to detect a, a COVID response that was based upon more of the generic features of the virus. Uh, that would that would uh, tell me a little bit more about that. 
Sure. I mean, when you think about, um, so, so the, the, the SARS-CoV, uh, let's just, we use, we're talking about SARS-CoV here. We, we've, we've basically got, uh, I think, two peptide mixes, an MHC1 and MHC2, which deals with okay. both the CD4 and the CD8 parts, all of that sort of thing. Now, again, because it's a specific peptide mix, again, it's, it's, it's very specific to that. It's, it's made up of different epitopes of the specific virus. And again, you will get a response from those T cells from the PBMC. So it's not, it's not, as you said, it's not really specific for any specific variant. Now, when we talk about exposure to SARS-CoV, um, you know, the, whether that's following vaccination or whether it's, you know, whether it's following exposure of a different variant, we, we will do, and people will get exposed uh, specifically to that. And again, if you read papers, of course, it's not as prevalent um, as it was, but certainly, the, I guess, the 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 potential is, is the more times you're exposed, the, the, the greater chance you've most probably got of getting some symptoms that are associated with long COVID. So although when we talk about exposure to SARS-CoV, it's not going to go away. And the question then, going go back to the T-cell diagnostic around, is there a way it, to detect it early? Because what you don't want to do is leave it too late. And 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 the thought is, is you know, if you leave it too late, would, would your immune system hardwire into a new paradigm? And then once it does that, is it harder to come back from sort of thing? And again, you know, if you look at a lot of papers and they, they, they look at this, certainly some of the major symptoms like chronic fatigue and, and, and uh, you know, cognitive brain fog and stuff and things like that, for something like NE, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, long COVID, or even somebody who's maybe had Lyme disease for a long period, it's very, very similar. You know, and so the question then is, is, is that dysfunction of the adaptive immune system, particular T cells, are having an effect on, you know, and i uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria and oxidative stress because they're all very, very linked. They're very linked within the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. And um, so I, I think, you know, I'd be very surprised if a lot of the, there's not an awful lot of commonality. Uh, you know, if you leave uh, symptoms long enough, a post-viral syndrome, there'll be an awful lot of commonality around a lot of the major symptoms, not all of the symptoms, but a lot of the major symptoms. Is there a utility for your platform potentially to work in tandem with vaccination strategies that, you know, I, I've been vaccinated, I've had SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, but I sure would like to know my state of immunity now to whether I should go get another uh, booster or, you know, or, or do I have sufficient um, sure. um it, so you see where I'm going. Do I have yeah, sufficient no, antibodies? Exactly. And, and to the point, yes, you can. Because usually what you would expect when you when you have, certainly if we've all been, the majority of us have, have been vaccinated, and usually what you, you get a T-cell response. And I think certainly some of the viruses, they're obviously, they're, the, the, um, sorry, a, a lot of the vaccinations, uh, vaccines are slightly different. RNA based, you know, vector based and stuff and things like that. But generally, you know, you've got a six month, you know, inter you know, a T cell response and it and then it tends to wane wane off sort of thing. And it's different for some of the different vaccines. So to yes, um you could use the test specifically for SARS-CoV to, to look to see, you know, how your immune response uh, was and when it be after a period of time to see if you needed to get another booster. Now for most people that might not be, the, they might not specifically want that, but certainly there are populations, you know, that, that might be immune compromised, might be a, a greater risk where that is super important. So you talked about, you know, when the when companies are developing vaccines, of course, they look at the serology, they look at the, the antigen formation or the anti, but they don't they don't regularly test for the immune response because the immune response is very important. You can yeah. have an antibody, you know, but you can have quite a weak response. So going back to something like, um, going back to something like, you know, the transplant with something like CMV and whatever, you know, of course, people will have the virus and whatever, you know, but it's important to know the immune response. Because if you've got a strong immune response, then you may be a, a less of a risk and whatever, you know, than somebody who doesn't sort of thing. And again, going back to what we were talking about with the SARS-CoV, if that person 
does it have a, a strong memory T cell response specifically to that? It may well be that they might want to actually get, you know, a, you know, another booster or another vaccinated specifically for that. So we've talked about SARS-CoV. You could say the same thing about RSV or influenza, you know, anything, because there are certain yeah. people who are at more risk, elderly, young, and whatever, you know, and, and certainly, you know, when we talk about developing the, the, the diagnostic, you know, we're working with researchers, we're doing clinical studies, you know, those, you know, longitudinally as well, sort of, you know, over a couple of years, it's, we want to also increase the, the knowledge specifically around this, as well as develop the actual uh, diagnostics uh, uh, as well. Is something like this ever going to be amenable for, say, home use rather than have to have a clinical test? I think ultimately, ultimately, if you can, you would love to be able to specifically do that. So, when you, well, when you think about your antigen tests and stuff and things like that for SARS-CoV and whatever, would it get to that? No, but I think certainly what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to turn around that, excuse me, that data quickly. And when we talk about quickly, um, you know, within a few days, you know, so you could even think about, you know, could you, could you provide some sort of app where you could actually sort of get that information back to the, yeah. to the person within a few days and stuff like that. Now, ultimately what we want to be doing is we want to be working with, you know, the healthcare providers because we want to be sort of, you know, helping that with that diagnosis, you know, it, it, you know, it, to the person as quickly as quickly as we specifically can, and we certainly don't want to be doing things or making sort of decisions for people, which you know takes away from that that clinical intervention because that's super important. So we want to be working with you know the you know the investigators and you know who who understand and know the you know whether it be Lyme disease or whether it be long COVID or whatever you know, and and that's. That's super important because it has to have value and we want to, we'd love to be able to get it right in uh, at the beginning of that journey. Because going back to something like ME or chronic fatigue, people, the problem there many, many years, and I've known lots of people who have, uh, have ME, uh, it's the diagnosis. And the diagnosis, there's no diagnosis for long COVID. Uh, there's no diagnosis for, for any, or uh, at least no diagnostic uh, for that. And the problem is, is when it's left too late, it becomes more of a problem. Yeah, that's, uh, and we've had a number of guests on the podcast series over the years that talk about, um, and one of them with respect to SARS-CoV-2, about the potential to excite endogenous human retroviruses if you are maintaining these latent infections. And and they do manifest as some severe um, neurological disorders, things like that. Yeah. So I, I really think these are really cool technologies. And you mentioned um, Lyme disease. Yes. Um, Last November, when I had my uh, my bout with, the, ended up in the hospital with recurring fevers. The first yep. thing they treated me for was Lyme disease because some of the symptoms overlapped. But they said the test is really lousy. So is yep. this kind of test a real uh, improvement upon standard ways to detect Lyme disease? Yes. Yeah, so so as you said, there there are. I think nowadays, uh, you know, when you're tested for Lyme disease, uh, it's ELISA based and Western block based. I think they they're the two sort of, and the the. I guess the problem, I mean, I think people who get a tick by, you know, 30% will get the, you know, get around the round sort of circle maybe, but, you know, 70% don't. The pro I guess yeah. the problem with the tests at the moment, they're not overly sensitive in that they miss quite a lot of people. And usually what happens is people will go through an antibiotic treatment for, say, 20 days sort of thing, whatever, you know. So the thought is that it misses a lot of people. And even following the antibiotic treatment, you're just waiting another three months to see if any of the focal or non-focal symptoms actually sort of come up with Lyme disease. So what we're wanting to do with respect to, you know, our sort of, you know, uh, diagnostic is to, yes, look at the IgG, IgM uh, antibody production, but also look at interferon gamma IL-2 uh, are the immune response as well uh, uh, to that or whatever, you know. So, and we're ho the hope is, is that that by itself, that you've got an immune response, you've got the antibody, it will give you a, a, some sort of idea of when when you actually got the infection, but it will also give you some guidance on the immune response. And the question there is, is if you if you go onto the FDA website, I think where they want to go is 
if they want to have a diagnostic that, that is more sensitive, but also give some sort of guidance on the cure or whatever, you know, because again, you go through one, one set of antibiotics and you don't really know if it's working or not. So the thought here is, is there something that you can do with the test to help with that sensitivity, but also give some sort of guidance um, with the actual um, um, with the actual treatment itself. So we will be and we are sort of working with specific researchers and um, um, not just for the people who have had Lyme disease for a number of years uh, and they've got, say, some sort of dysfunction in the neural system, but also for people who are newly diagnosed and to follow them over that, you know, six months, 12 month period and whatever to see if we have a diagnostic that is more sensitive, but also get sort of guidance on the immune response specifically to that. And and does that actually give you some guidance around the cure, uh, you know, or the treatment of those people, uh, um, which needs to be a lot better than it actually is. And I guess maybe kind of winding down here, but um, different cancers, and I may be speaking outside of my expertise, it seems like different cancer subtypes have different presentations of surface antigens that excite a T-cell response to some degree. Yeah. And are, is there a potential uh, diagnostic value to your technology that may be able to see the presence of any kind of neoplasia before it actually manifests as, say, a solid tumor or actually uh, as something that would present uh, normal cancer type symptoms. Yeah, I mean the, the thing is, is most of these, you know, we t we talked about, uh, you know, BD one and like three and stuff and things like that. Whatever, you know, the the, the hematologically maybe uh, <laughs> um, the the solid tumors usually, you know, the, the solid tumors you need biopsies and stuff and things. Like that. That's the problem. But you know, unless it's maybe it's it's you know it's it's dermal uh, okay. or something like that, it's most probably a little bit more amenable sort of thing again. But biopsies and and, and you're talking to somebody who's worked for an, an oncology for the last twenty years, and but it, it it is a complicated business. And 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 that when we when we talk about is when we talk about oncology, we talk about the tumor microenvironment. That microenvironment is, I'm going to say it's very similar. It's very similar to the, it's chemokines, it's, it's cytokines, it's oxidative stress. It, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, a cancer slightly different because what it will do is it will shut off all of the things that are there to kill it. Uh, you know, and, and it will, you know, so I, I think for, for us, other than the CAR T, uh, because it's even so logical, and we can actually we can get the because it's more of a liquid type biopsy, not a liquid biopsy or a liquid sort of diagnostic that we're doing. It that might be a little bit more amenable, but with respect to the solid tumor, because you need to actually get into the actual tissue itself and take the tissue. I think, you know, the the current. Um, sort of sequencing that is done, you know, for a specific mutations, you know, by a lot of the a lot of the the sort of companies. That's most probably where it's going to be. Where you're looking at specific mutations, and there's been a huge bounds made in the field around understanding specific mutation or driver mutations, and then targeting specifically those. Well, Dr. Nigel McCracken, thank you very much for your time today. This was really exciting. If people want to know more about Viral Biolabs, where do they look? Yeah, no, um, thanks, Kevin. You can find all of our social media links uh, on the pages at the bottom of our website, and the website being virax.com. Uh, That's V-I-R-A-X, right? It's uh, V I R A X. Yeah, v -I -R -A -X. Yes, uh, we do have Twitter X handle accounts uh, at Virax Biolabs, uh, Virax underscore Biolabs. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Best wishes, and as products emerge and applications come out, please get back to me and we'll have you on again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you again for listening to the Talking Biotech Podcast. Think about new novel diagnostic tools and ways that they may be used to help us understand the prevalence of specific disorders. They may help us from things from herpes to understanding long COVID, which could be quite a problem as we've seen. So this is the Talking Biotech Podcast by Collabora, and we'll talk to you again next week.